Okay, let us begin. I'm going to share something on the screen so that we can get a, see where we are. Since I was a child, I've always loved maps. I love studying maps, memorizing maps. And then I realized maps, like any other form of information, can, can be manipulated by people with an agenda, as we see nowadays. Uh, one of the things that the, let's say, the pro Israel lobby and their, uh, I guess their opponents or adversaries like to do is talk about who puts what on what map, what maps do not represent Israel, what maps put, let's say, uh, the West Bank and, and the Golan as uh, Palestinian uh, territory occupied by Israel, other things. So you can, it's part of the, the information war. So I guess maps as, as a record are uh, just as important sometimes as the written word. And uh, now we'll see Eretz Israel itself as a concept uh, requires us to be have a little bit of familiarity with the map. We have to know what we're talking about. And then uh, we'll begin to see that there's actually some uh, interesting, uh, interesting tovanot, interesting understandings we get about how uh, the Torah, by uh, prescribing that there be a specific holy land where the commands are performed and also connecting it to uh, the most important events in Jewish history, uh, basically our holidays and our fast days, uh, and Jewish and historical tragedy, uh, what's going on there. So let's begin with uh, some important sources. If, by the way, if the map disappears, please tell me. The first, hold on, someone's coming in. The first reference to what you and I know as the land of Israel is right at the beginning of the book of Genesis. And I don't do it by chapter, I just know it by the parasha. Uh, after the flood, we read about the tables of all the descendants of Noah. And I am indebted once again to the Dot Mikra for pointing this out, that even though we find uh, the 70 nations as described by the sages uh, are mentioned there as descending from Noah's three sons, uh, only one of his grandsons has a country that for which its borders are described. It's interesting because one of the, the major children of Canaan, Canaan, Yalad, Sidon, Bechoro, Echei, Canaan's father was Ham. Says Necham Kushu Mitzrayim Ufutu Hanan. You have Kush, which is basically uh, modern day Sudan in Ethiopia, basically the uh, what in biblical times and in Chazal's times are referred to everywhere, uh, which is in the south of Egypt and going to the south. And Mitzrayim, of course, is Egypt. Uh, notice that name is also interesting. So it's, it's a dual name. It's in, in Hebrew, the form is a double of something. Uh, hold on one second. Um, I have to do something here. Hold on. Make co-host. There we go. Okay. And Kushu uh, Mutzrayim, uh, Put. Put is uh, Northern Africa and Canaan. Canaan is basically Eretz Israel. It says here that Canaan begat. By the way, it, it's a very, it seems almost clear that a lot of the people mentioned here are not literally children just that they were offshoots of it. They originally, the settlement started in Canaan and uh, it continued. For example, Sidon is not a person or a nation, although eventually we have uh, basically the Sidonians uh, are sometimes used as a general word for the Phoenicians as we know them in history. Sidon is a city. So Sidon is considered uh, Canaan's firstborn. Uh, that would be somewhere over here. Uh, I think it's to the south of what's nowadays Beirut. If we zoom in now, see it, nowadays Beirut is the main city on the, yeah, see, just to the south here, that's the main city on the Lebanese coast. So, and that was never really conquered by the Jewish people. So that area remained uh, non-Jewish, or at least in under non-Jewish control throughout history. But that's basically where Canaan starts. And then we have Heth. Heth is basically a reference to the peoples, the ancient Hittites, who basically lived up around here. This whole area starting from the north along the Levantine coast and going into central Turkey. It turns out there was a large Hittite empire at various points in Jewish history. And some of these Hittites, B'nai Chayth, that's what they're called, B'nai Chayth, or they're just the Chitim, they lived in the center of nowadays what you and I know as Israel proper. Uh, let's continue. Uh, here. There's also the, the Jebusite, those are the ones who live around Jerusalem, the Amorite, uh, the central mountain region, and also they conquered part of the Transjordan, and the Gir Girgashi, the, the group that apparently 
picked up and left and founded Carthage uh, when the Jews first showed up. Uh, the Hivites, the Archites, and the Sinites. Look at these. These are references also to other settlements along the coast in what is nowadays, nowadays Beirut. Uh, you can look in one of the more uh, uh, detailed Mepharshim, the modern ones that actually show there is like the Dot Mikra. Uh, same thing for the Arwadi, the Samari, and the Hamathi. Hamath is off the coast, though. It's nowadays Hama, and uh, you can find it again on some good maps. It's not such a big place, but it used to be considered uh, like the main northernmost point of Mashiach. Lebanon. What was that? Someone said something? Okay. Just a reminder, buddy. We're gonna... Okay. We're going to, if there's any uh, interference there, if you hear, if you hear like there's doubling or uh, interference, please tell me. So Lavo Hamath, as you approach Hamath, is uh, at least before the times of the Jewish settlement that was considered uh, the northernmost part of the land of Canaan. And then it says here, why he gavul haknani mi Sidon. The border of this Canaanite people was from Sidon. That's basically the northernmost part of over here. All the way down south to Boacha Gorara Ad Aza, Boacha Sidon Vambara Vadma Utsvoim Ad Lashda. If you start up here in the north at Sidon and you continue southbound along the coast and in the mainland, you'll eventually get to over here. Uh, the land of Gaza. See, this is Ashkelon to the south. Gaza is the major city here. Gaza is an ancient city. And uh, what used to be known as Gerar has still not yet been identified, but somewhere down here. And these other places, Sedoma, Amura, Adma, Tzvim, Adlasha, they were also somewhere near what's nowadays the Dead Sea. Uh, it's inconclusive. We don't, because God destroyed these places, of course, and basically formed a lot of what is now the Dead Sea area in this uh, this salty valley, lowest place on earth. Uh, it, we don't really know where it is, but apparently Lasha is somewhere on the east coast of the Dead Sea, or at least uh, before its destruction. So we've basically seen that uh, even before Abraham was born, uh, what we would call real uh, proto-history is before the Torah actually starts recording things that can be identified with positive history, basically anything before the flood, uh, because the Torah is describing something that was destroyed it, we see that it cannot actually be describing anything that we could uncover uh, by ourselves. So we don't consider that real recorded history in the usual sense. We say that the recording of history basically begins with Abraham. We're basically setting the stage for him. So this would be the gvulot of the Kanani. It says there's a northernmost part and there's a southernmost part. That's the way it's described in Genesis at the beginning. And then we get to something more interesting. We get to the land promised to Abraham. Until that point, we just see that this land sort of was described in great detail. Why do they have borders? It's because this will become the promised land. This is the land that God will give to Abraham. So it needs to be, uh, it needs to be described because it is the most important land uh, for everything we're going to be studying from here on in. Uh, also, I am indebted to Dot McRuff for pointing this out. Hold on. Uh, hold on. Okay, fine. Uh, it, this land was given to the Canaanites because the uh, people of Israel are going to, to be taking it over. It's kind of interesting. It fits the Pasuk. Uh, normally, uh, classical interpretations with which people are familiar say that Yatsev Gvulot Amim Lumis Parbene Israel. At the end of the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu uh, talks about uh, the the it's in the Shira of Hazin, who God created the world. He set up the borders of the nations according to the number of the children of Israel. And people usually say that refers to the 70 children of Israel who went down to Egypt. His family was 70. And that's the 70 nations described correspondingly in this uh, table of nations at the end of the Parsha of Noah. But you could also say, that it refers to these 12 Canaanite groups we see over here, uh, the descendants of Canaan, uh, and there's 12 of them here, and they correspond to the chosen people, the, the 12 tribes of Israel who are eventually supposed to replace them. It's kind of interesting, as we've noted before, this idea of having 12 major offshoot tribes or descendant nations is something that God was doing back in the day before, I guess he so to speak, chose Israel 
and designate them as the true chosen people. There are other, like the sages say in Pirkei Avot, there are other potentials, others who could have stepped up and done it, starting with, of course, uh, Yoktan. Yoktan was uh, the younger brother of Abraham's ancestor, Peleg. It says that uh, Aver had two sons, uh, Peleg and Yoktan. And uh, the right Rashi points out, Aver apparently had prophetic powers because uh, his, uh, his sons had portentous names. Yoktan has... 12 descendants right there, uh, closely related to Abraham's line, but they're not end up being the chosen one. Same thing happens to Abraham's brother Nahor, who also has a list. He had 12 uh, uh, sons who also apparently became great, uh, as did Ishmael. And Esav also is uh, subdivided into 12 alufim, ultimately. You see that God was basically uh, uh, in, in Kabbalah, they say it's a Gilgul of the same bracha. It keeps coming back on itself. Either way, uh, we'll see what the land promised to Abraham was. It says, uh, now it's defined uh, slightly geographically, but also by population replacement. That is, we're going to define the lands uh, occupied by certain groups, and Abraham's descendants and his followers are to take those places over. And here it says for the first time, the Zaracha Natati at Aris Hazoth. This is at the Brith Ben Abitharim. And it's not at the beginning of Parsha Lechacha. It says, Minahar Misraim Ad Hanahar Gadol Nahar Parath. From the river of Egypt, or the stream of Egypt, until the great river, Nahar Parath. Nahar Parath is considered the most. That's the Euphrates, by the way. So it's considered the main river. Sometimes it doesn't even need to be referred to as the Great River, or Pirath, Euphrates, it just has to be called the river because it is so much greater than the other ones. So let's look where Pirath basically starts. It's quite north, actually. Here it is on the map. Here's its main way as it winds through what's nowadays Iraq. It, its headwaters are up here in northern Syria and a little bit up in Turkey. So, wow, that, that's a lot longer or a lot more than we saw t- before. Uh, remember, it says that the Gvul de Kanani was basically from Sidon, which is even south here. Tripoli is one of these cities, but I forget which one of the, the nations we mentioned before. Uh, the the Gaona Mori defined what's nowadays known as Tripoli, which is basically from uh, a Hellenized name. Uh, you see the triple in there. It means uh, the triple city. But one of these, I think it was the Arki or the Tsmari or the Arwadi, one of those we saw in the name. That's also an ancient settlement that eventually became this city of Tripoli. So when they say Parath, they basically mean the, the part of the river that's closest to the land of Israel. And that's quite surprising. It turns out Haran, ancient Haran, was just over the river. And this would mean that if you look over here, here's Hama. We mentioned that before. Now it showed up on the map. I guess it depends on how much we zoom in. Aleppo was where a uh, major population of Syrian Jewry. And this would basically mean that Eretz Israel covers a lot of what's nowadays this area, Syria, and of course, lots of Lebanon, and even maybe approaching parts of Turkey, depending on where exactly you say uh, Adha Nahar, Nahar Parath. But God promised Abraham parts of that land until Nahal Mitzrayim, which as we go southwest, is actually a subject of dispute. There are Rishonim who say it's referring to Wadi El Arish. See, here's Arish, and this is Wadi El Arish. It's a stream over here. And that's one Rav Shechter likes to mention. I do not know why, but I prefer this one, this identification of Nahar Mitzrayim as Wadi El Arish, because it seems to be a natural border for the land of Israel. Everything beyond here is just great desert. And the other major opinion says it's the eastern edge of the delta. Here's the Nile Delta. You can see it on the map. Uh, Basically, for all of history, Egypt has mostly only been settled in the green areas, the way the areas that are watered by the Nile. Everything else is just great desert. And if you've been to Egypt, apparently that's the case. So that's that's the way it's been throughout history. And then you get up to the Delta where the Nile basically splits off and there's a much more fertile area spread out. And you can see that that's on the map. So it's more greener, it's much more settled. So they say Eretz Israel goes up to the edge of the Delta over here. And they, it's called the Shehor. Uh, the Nal Shihor, and by the way, it turns out the coastline apparently has changed over the course of the, the last few millennia. Uh, not Nothing major. I, I don't think that's the case because then we'd put the border of Eretz Israel right up to the border of Egypt. And therefore, if the Jews would just leave Egypt this way, they would technically cross over into Eretz Israel, the promised land. 
Uh, there's nothing much here either. It's not doesn't seem to be so hospitable. And uh, we'll see that there's supposed to be areas that are neither Eretz Israel or neither Egypt uh, mentioned in the Bible. And where are you going to put them? If Eretz Israel comes all the way up to, let's say, this de- identification of the Har Mitzrayim as the edge of the delta, where are you going to put uh, put the areas of Paran and Shur, for example, where the Ishmaelites settled? There are supposed to be places in between, which is why uh, I, I think that it, it makes more sense. You find this in other classical sources, Mefarshim, and just the maps that they make that you can find there. Uh, they identify Wadi El Arish as the Nachal Mitzrayim in the southern western edge of the land promised to Abraham. And the Nachal Mitzrayim is mentioned a few other times also as the southwestern border of the land of Israel. For some reason, I don't know why, the saying you could take issue with the Dot Mikra, despite how being indebted to them, they generally prefer the identification of Nachal Mitzrayim with this eastern edge of the Nile Delta. Okay, I guess they have their reasons. Uh, they, they didn't ask me and I didn't ask them, so we'll just leave it at that. Then we have, hold on a second, we'll let some people in. We then have the description given in Parashat uh, Mas'e, where apparently Moses described to the incoming leadership of the Jewish people, you know, there's a conquest of this land that we have to undertake. You have to know what exactly you were told to, con- to conquer. And he describes it in great detail. He says, Once again, the land is named Canaan. Uh, why is it, by the way, Canaan? If Canaan is not necessarily uh, an individual uh, with that name, then the land, we could say, carries this name because Canaan actually has a number of meanings. Uh, for example, uh, etymologically, Canaan means lowly. Uh, Canaan means to surrender, for example, or to be brought down. So Canaanim might be lowly people. Uh, in quite a few contexts in the Bible, it's not an ethnicity, but rather it's referring to people who trade, uh, sea merchants, seafaring merchants. And it could also be a reference to the land being a low land. You look at the map of Eretz Israel, you find something very interesting. A lot of it is coastal. So that's, of course, sea level. And then you get to the eastern area over here. And people have noticed for a long time that this Jordan Rift Valley is actually quite low. The Canaanim... Like we say, uh, the Amorites live, it says the Canaanites live along the coast and along the Jordan, and the Amorites live in the hill country, uh, the central hill country. And it turns out this rift uh, is quite below sea level. Uh, for example, you start at the Kinneret and uh, Tiberi over here, Tiberius, where, of course, uh, once again, there's biblical settlement from the time, was used to be called the Brakat, it's mentioned as one of the places where the Israelites settled right at the beginning, uh, this is already quite a few hundred meters below sea level, uh, one of the lowest places on earth. And it just kept getting lower as the Jordan goes south along this, basically this fault line. It's a big crack in the ground that's quite low. It's a fault line. And that's why the river flows through there. And the, the Sea of Galilee itself, the Kinneret sits on basically a big uh, crater, uh, crater shape thing uh, on the fault line. And that's why they say, don't drain the water from the Kinneret because if there's not enough water pressure pushing down, then the hot springs below and the volcanic activity will actually come up through the sea and uh, permanently salinate the, the body of water there. It keeps going down south, the Jordan River, and it keeps dropping the elevation such that the lowest point on earth is the Dead Sea. This whole desert is quite low. And then only once you start going back up toward the Gulf of Aqaba, you start rising again. So the fact that the land had this loneliness to it was saying that was no, that's what Canaan means. Uh, here he describes the borders and he says that uh, the southern border, Pat Negev. Negev is a reference to the large desert in the south of the land of Israel, and it's also used, uh, therefore, as uh, a synonym for south. Uh, it starts in what's classically known as the land of Edom down here. And then it goes up to the edge of Yamamela on the east side. And you could read the details over here. Uh, for us, the southern border seems to make sense, but then it goes all the way north. And it says that there's a Hor Hahar. There's a, a northernmost point uh, along this phone. So there is apparently, and this hasn't been conclusive, we know of a place, Hor Hahar, 
down here uh, near what used to be Petra Petra, uh, where they have those amazing uh, carved, they, uh, the Nabate Nabateans, if I'm not mistaken, carved amazing temple-like structures into the stone itself, the red stone. It's a major tourist attraction. That's the old Kadesh, not Kadesh Panera, but the Kadesh where uh, it says the Israelites encamped before crossing the land of Edom and where Miriam died. And near this Kadesh, if you go a little bit farther, people go here on the first day of Av, which is Aaron's yard site. We know where he was buried. That's the Horahar down here in the land of Edom. People cross the Jordanian border nowadays so they can go there on, on his yurt site. But there's another Horahar apparently somewhere on the coast. And it's not too clear where it is, but it's somewhere north of Haifa, uh, perhaps near, near once again, Sidon and Tyre. Tyre is not mentioned as being one of those places. It's a later built city, uh, the biblical Tzor, but eventually came quite an amazing city. Uh, and uh, it says that this, uh, it connects sort of with Levo Hamath, which we saw already on the map is that is Hama. So it's somewhere up around here, perhaps near Beirut, wherever it may be. But that is what Moses was commanding uh, the people to conquer. And it says that uh, they would they would have to conquer this and then divide it among the 12 tribes. It says here, well, at least the, the tribes are extinct, so nine and a half of the tribes. This is the land. It says, So one of the interesting things that comes out here is that this does not exactly fit the land promised to Abraham. It doesn't say, for example, up until the, the, the Euphrates River. It actually stops quite south of the Euphrates River. And even though Moses is going to say later in Devarim that God has promised, has promised them the land all the way up to the Euphrates, for now, these nine and a half tribes are only being told to conquer uh, a more limited area up to Levo Hamath. And by the way, that's where the spies went until. Apparently, and this is something very important, apparently the commandment given by Moses took into account that in this generation, they would be unable to, it wasn't expected of them, and they would not be able to conquer the entire promised land, uh, uh, the entire promised land as promised to Abraham. That's very important. There's, they're basically, they're saving something for later. And uh, that's something that they actually say, uh, and the sages of the Maimonides brings this, yes, indeed, there was certain land that was uh, promised to Abraham, but was specifically left out. Eventually, they will have to get there. When? We'll see. We, we should go back a drop over here that it says, uh, land promised to Abraham included the following. So tell me what, what doesn't fit. It says the land of the Kini, the Knizi, the Kadmoni, the Haiti, Prizi, Rifaim, and Mori Knani, Yirgoshi, and Haivusi. So we have three of them in the first Pasuk. First, the, the Kini, the Knizi, and the Kadmoni basically are to the southeast and ended up not going to Abraham himself. Uh, the Kani, Kizi, and Kamuni are basically down here. And these areas, and also a little bit over here, are in the Transjordan. These areas went to Amon, Moab, and Edom, uh, from starting from the north. The northernmost most, most one, the modern-day city of Amman, uh, is, uh, has always been identified with the place described in the Bible uh, called Rabat B'nai Amon. So the name is preserved already as Amman. That was the major settlement of Amon, uh, one of the sons of Lot and the people he founded, they took over the land of the Rephaim. The Rephaim live up here. So the Ammonites basically replaced the Rephaim, and so the Moabites, who live more to the south over here. And Edom is basically this area over here, sometimes going all the way down as far to Etzion Gever, which is uh, nowadays a lot. The, the biblical a lot in Etzion Gever is the modern day Jordanian city of Aqaba. And uh, right over the border, the Jews founded their own city. See, there's a lot in Aqaba. You look on a map, a uh, satellite map, you see that it's just a political board between them. It looks like one big metropolis now. And uh, there's only a line separates the Israeli new, basically the old city is Aqaba and the new city is Eilat. So these areas the, the, of the Kini, of the Knizi, the Kadmoni, the Kini, and the Rifaim, uh, basically were not given to Abraham eventually and his descendants. They, well, sorry, it would have been given to people connected to Abraham. Lot is Abraham's nephew. Edom is basically Abraham's grandson. But Israel did not get all of these. By Israel, I mean uh, the descendants of Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Uh, but we can identify the Chiti, the Prizi, the Amori, the Knani, the Girgashi, and the Yivusi. 
who's missing from the list? Uh, well, we have the Chiti and, and the Prizi. We don't have the, we have the Yavusi. So we have all six of them. Uh, and uh, sometimes I have trouble seeing which one is missing. We don't have the Chivi on this list. They were mentioned earlier. And the Chivi, apparently, uh, some of them uh, lived around Shem, and there are those who identify them also with the Hori, very closely uh, related etymologically. Uh, and for some reason, we never find, well, we don't find so often the seven uh, more well-known Canadian nations mentioned that often together. There's always one missing, usually the Girgashi, uh, so meant, and it's always a different order. Why that is, uh, could be the topic for another year, but not for tonight. So already we saw in Abraham's time, he was promised something. And we already see that certain of those promises were then given to someone else. Uh, it reminds you of the the British mandate for Palestine, where they uh, declare that this whole area that they called Palestine, which includes modern day Israel and large parts of what are today Jordan, basically Jordan, and also some, I think the Golan Heights was included. That was what they intended as, well, at least those who, who were intending this, it wasn't unanimous among even the British and the government officials. Uh, the Balfour Declaration was talking about this 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 uh, larger uh, Palestine and Transjordanian Palestine, and then they cut off part of it and just said, oh, everything on the east, we're just gonna give to uh, these Hashemites who we've basically pushed out of Saudi Arabia. And you see here, once again, Abraham was promised certain land, it's less than that described in, in the Parashat Noah. And some of it was actually given to other uh, national groups that had an association or, or a descent, uh, descent from Abraham. And then Moses is even limiting more uh, what they're supposed, they supposed to conquer. So I was trying to say, so what is Eretz Israel supposed to be? Uh, in this case, the, there's an idea uh, in the sages that uh, two things. Eventually, the land of the Kadmoni, the Knizi, and the Kini, and the rest of Rephaim, the Transjordan, and everything to the south there, will become part of the land of Israel. And more so, when the Jewish people finish conquering what Moses told them to conquer, they are supposed to eventually come into control the areas more to the north, up to the Euphrates River. And they're supposed to do it in a very specific order. And eventually, that will be an amazing piece of land the Jewish people will divide among themselves once again. They'll even make new cities of refuge. And that's what we look forward to. And over here, uh, I'm not going to share this specifically. I will, actually, we will hold here. I have to change the screen share just for one minute. We go, okay. Um, hold on one second. We'll put this up on the screen. Okay. So we have here a text that Maimonides is describing what Eretz Yisrael is. And he describes the, the sanctification of the land. This is basically his own opinion in uh, understanding what the sages of the Talmud said. There are uh, differences of opinion, by the way. He's not the last one. He's the one who wrote the most comprehensive, uh, I guess, uh, summation and uh, halachic ruling. This is the one we generally follow, despite the fact that there are some you know, differences of opinion here and there, or some even some major ones. He describes Eretz Israel as being land that is conquered by the king of Israel. Notice he says of here, Shekib Shan Melch Israel Onovimi Dat Rov Yisrael. Other places he describes just the king, in other places he describes the Melech, the Navi, or the Shofet, Midat Rov Yisrael. And he calls it uh, Kibush Rabim, conquest by the the many, that is, the, the, the community does it. But you can't have, let's say, one person, an uh, individual conquering, that doesn't make it land of Israel. And he refers to a land that was eventually conquered by uh, the Ole Mitzrayim. That means the, the first generation Joshua's time. That was land that became part of the halachic land of Israel that was sanctified. What does it mean? That's where the commandments, uh, that's where the commandments are in force. By the commandments, I don't mean, let's say, wearing tefillin and Shabbat. I mean, you know, the commandments that specifically re, uh, refer to control of the land and farming it. The mitzvot ha'tuliyot ba'aretz, the land, the commandments that are dependent on control of the land, as we have seen in previous shurim. So that is the area that they, they conquered in Joshua's time. And then he says, basically, it's uh, the borders, uh, not quite so well defined, but it basically ref uh, fits almost over here. There's a line that goes all the way from, like, let's say, the edge of the Gaza Strip across the south over here, somewhere through the Negev. 
and up until somewhere north of Haifa. And then it gets a little bit shadier because there are specific cities that they left unconquered. So as we go more north, there's more of a native population left there. That's what happened. They, they conquered and controlled. And even before they finished conquering and driving out some of the, the people over here in, in what's nowadays Lebanon, this would be the northern tribes, the tribe of Usher and Naphtali. They didn't even bother conquering necessarily. They, they conquered or they, they were able to acquire lands and make room, but they certainly did not control it politically, these areas. So what's nowadays Lebanon, uh, especially along the coast, it basically says in the book of Judges that these two northern tribes lived among the Canaani and the Sidonians. And the northernmost area that they conquered and took control of was somewhere over here in the north, what was called Laish and eventually called Dun, where the headwaters of the Jordan are. And that's where they stopped basically. And in King David's time, he continued the conquest, but he didn't conquer this area of Lebanon. And he was supposed to, they first have to finish conquering what Moses said to conquer. And the problem is that he actually uh, was, uh, came into a very strong alliance with the King of Tzor, which is sort of a problem because they were Canaanim classically. And even if they became B'nai Noach and they stopped worshiping idols such that King David and King Solomon could actually uh, cooperate with them in the building of the temple and obtaining the materials for building the temple. We're talking about Hiram, King of Tzor. Whatever it was, David did not take this area into his political control and instead continued the conquest all the way through what's called Aram. This, these areas are here around Damascus, classically called Aram. And he did conquer all the way up to this area uh, as approaching the Euphrates River. But Chazal say, and this is the way the Rambam rules, it did not, he did not consider it a proper co national conquest because David did in the wrong order. He should have left, he should not have left these areas along the coast unconquered. Uh, so that's a little bit of a problem. So we have this, this, these areas called the land of the Ole Mitzrayim, as it was, and uh, areas that King David conquered, that's they call the Kibush Yahid, basically areas all the way over here, everything beyond the Golan Heights. And then there was the second, uh, the second commonwealth, where instead of conquering, they just returned to those lands and resettled them. And it was more limited than the areas in the first commonwealth. So you have this overlap in the maps. You have areas where they call them the Ole Bavel, those who returned from Babylon or Babylonia. Uh, areas, there was areas in the north around Beit Sha'an and also down here in the, in the valleys where they knew it had been part of Eretz Israel the first time around, but now it is not resettled. So they said that those areas, uh, are the, the, the commandments don't apply to them. And that's why even nowadays you could find there's certain produce they're selling in the stores that's Shemitah free. That is, it's not considered Shishit. It's not considered a uh, land that the, the Beit Din has sold, uh, which would be the Heter Mechira. It's not that it's been taken over by another Beit Din and being farmed and uh, harvested uh, because they're not individual Jews. They're not obligated to keep the Shemitah. That's what Otsar Beit Din is. And it's not areas they had to, uh, they let, they uh, allow Gentiles to own and be under their control like the Bedats does, Yavul Nochri. This is Jewish owned area now and they farm it in order to produce vegetables because technically it's not halachically Eretz Yisrael as sanctified the second time around. Of course, the problem with this is that Maimonides also describes the third commonwealth. And he says in our days, you're supposed to re-sanctify everything and draw new borders based on where the Jewish people settle now and uh, also start the Shemitah count again. So it's a little bit of a problem, but for now, that's how they hold. So you see there's all these different areas. What's defined Eretz Yisrael? This halachic definition of Eretz Yisrael is even more limited. First, we have the land described to Noah's descendants that was quite vast. The land promised to Abraham was a little bit more limited than that. Moses' commandment to the Jews, what to conquer and what to do, what to divide among the people is even more limited. And then the land that's uh, actually, they did conquer and sanctify even more limited than that. And the second time around, the lands that they held on to is even more limited. So we keep losing uh, parts of the land of Israel, uh, halakhically, but we have to know it's very hard to draw on a map exactly where it is. Maimonides describes a strip of land over here along the coast that was once Eretz Israel, but not. Uh, but we are, of course, supposed to reconquer it. There's a source over here 
uh, that uh, I we don't have time to go into this now. It's the fifth parak of Melachim and their wars. How Maimonides describes how you could technically live every everywhere, but how it's uh, the the Milo, the greatness of being able to live in the land of Israel. We should see that one day. And over here we have uh, Nachmanides' uh, gloss to the Sefer Mitzvot of the Rambam, where he says the Rambam forgot to actually count this as a mitzvah. The Rambam here that talks about how great it is to land of Israel and how important it is, how you're supposed to conquer it and keep it under Jewish control. Here my Nachmanides describes the exact commandment. Also, we'll go into this uh, one day soon. It's worth reading. Everybody should be familiar with this passage over here. Uh, it's very important to hold on to these lands, the lands of holiness and uh, what our responsibilities to it and how we're not supposed to be, let it stay under foreign control. By foreign, I mean non-Jewish control. It's meant to be the land of the Jews. So we basically come to a little bit of a problem over here. Let's just uh, look at these notes. Uh, Israel as a place of holiness and the commandments that we've seen before. Yeah, that's that's what Eretz Israel is. That's the place where holiness exists. It's the only place where we can perform certain commandments. That's described explicitly in the Mishnah. There's an earlier issue we saw that. And it's also a homeland. Uh, well, what does that mean, our homeland? If I were, let's say, uh, a Muhammad or uh, an L. Ron Hubbard type, I was fabricating a religion. I would say, like, uh, let's say any other national group, this is our land, it's always been ours, and that's it. And we ain't, we ain't going nowhere, and no one's going to take it away from us. That is uh, what I would say, if I, like I said, if I were making something up. But the problem is, we testify, and we have said this all along, our uh, scriptures describe this, our Talmud describes this, our history, uh, unfortunately, testifies to this, is that it's been hard to keep Eretz Israel specifically under Jewish control. It's also, I think, the major challenge uh, on a national scale. Uh, what do I mean? Our own scriptures, hold on one second. Our own scriptures first tell us that there were many national groups here before us. They even called the name still by the first major national group that, uh, that preceded us, the Canaanites, the land of Canaan. And it's only later in the Bible, the land is called Eretz Israel. Uh, for quite a few times in the Bible, it's called Eretz Canaan, even once it has come under Israelite control. Uh, Eretz Canaan, it says that the land was con conquered in Joshua's time, divided among the people. They put the tabernacle in Shiloh, everything was okay. And it says that uh, the Bnei God of Bnei Ruvain went back to the Avar Yardane, and they left everybody else in Eretz Canaan. The land was still called Eretz Canaan, apparently, even once it had become what you and I would call Jewish. And then uh, we talk about the difficulties of holding on to the land. The book of uh, Judges basically talks about how there was major minority uh, Canaanites and other related groups uh, still in the land and causing us problems. And they were influencing us to do the wrong thing. Eventually, they even tried to reassert themselves that it was in Deborah's times. And another group, the Philistines, became more powerful. Another waves of migration came. They took over a whole area on the Southwest and eventually came to control the entire country for a good century before King David put a stop to that uh, for, for good. And we also have that there are other groups along our edges, uh, the, the Moabites, the Canaanites, the Midianites, uh, the Moabites, the Edomites, no, sorry, not the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Arameans, the Amalekites, the Midianites, always causing us trouble uh, in making incursions into the land, uh, uh, marauding, despoiling the land, even taking some Jews into exile. It was quite difficult. And ultimately, the, the punishment as described uh, in the Torah for lack of keeping the commandments, uh, the ultimate punishment is exile, being removed from land, losing the land, and it being handed over to the enemy. But of course, it doesn't stay in their hands for too long. But we've seen... Uh, I, I like to de describe the four exiles. Uh, Jewish people went to exile when they first left the land uh, for Egypt during the famine. That was uh, Jacob's sons going to exile. And then there was an exile that's not so clearly described, but it's implied in quite a few verses uh, with the destruction of Shiloh. And of course, the exile that resulted from the destruction of the first commonwealth and the subsequent exile after the destruction of the second temple. So we've gone into exile quite a few times. We, we felt this. And the major challenge back then, the Rav has a sheer about this, 
throughout Second Temple times and even up until today is getting the Jewish people to come back and actually fulfill their divine mission to conquer and control the land and drive out those who would seek to harm them and take away their ability to properly settle the land. That's kind of strange. And I, like I said, I would have thought I, we would have said at least change the historical record or fabricated it, do something to make it seem like the voice had this land. But instead, uh, we suffer uh, within and without. We suffer from enemies uh, of non-Jewish extraction who are always trying to uh, take the land away from us uh, by hook or by crook, either through out, outright war or lawfare, uh, devious things. You know, the international community does not recognize the fact that I'm sitting in a Beit Midrash and owning a house in uh, uh, the areas north of Jerusalem. Makes no sense. Uh, my people have been here for thousands of years and I have no right to be here, but that's what they say. And it's the, you know, the, what it's the, it's the political cause of our time, except for nowadays uh, perversion and all sorts of immorality seems to be the political cause. But once uh, uh, things normalize again, God willing, uh, we will be the, the main problem. It's always those settlers and the fact that the Israel occupiers, et cetera, and we also have that problem, so we're our own self-accusers, the self-hating Jews who can't stand the fact that Jews live in the land of Israel and are dominant. Uh, there's a political class that just doesn't want to step up and take full control of the land of, land of Israel. And uh, most importantly, they're the Jews who leave the land of Israel. The Yerida rate is uh, unfortunately extremely high. Uh, Florida is basically another Israel, basically. And we've talked about that. And we also can't get the people who haven't even come here to want to settle here. It's a great challenge to get the, the Jews to leave the diaspora and just come over here and join us. And Moses himself, uh, in his rebuke to the children of God and the children of Reuben, basically said this. This is a hard thing. You've been uh, very stubborn about this for since I first met you. And you're going to weaken the morale of everybody else if you say you don't want to live in the land of Israel. The land of Israel, like the sages say, is nicknate only be surim, is acquired only through hardship. And indeed, holding on to the land of Israel or holding on to the Jews in the land of Israel has been for our entire history the biggest challenge. Remember, why, why were the generation uh, that left Egypt punished with having to die out in the desert? Because they rejected their first opportunity to go into the land and conquer it show that they rely on God and going to do that. And it took a whole a whole other generation to arise and replace them and see that God's promise is there if we just decide to take him up on that offer. And I don't know why, but that's been that has been the hardest thing. And the punishment, of course, is exile. The the, the great promise was the ultimate messianic promise to the Jewish people specifically. Rebuilding of the temple, there will be a Messiah. Uh, other promises of world peace. What does it mean for the Jewish people? What does it mean when it says Yatzmach uh, Purkanei, not Vikari Mishchein? That means the arrival of Messiah. Yatzmach Purkanei, or Vemru Hoshieno Hashem Lokenu, the Kabbatzinu Minagliim. In gather the exiles. Wow, it's, it's almost a. It, it seems almost like a far fetched, uh, perhaps an impossibility, but that has been the challenge. Holding on to Eretz Israel has been the challenge, uh, forever. And the Torah testifies, because the Torah is true, the Torah testifies how this was our uh, challenge since the beginning. There's always been those who have rival claims to the land of Israel, specific, specifically the Canaanites and their descendants have always been there uh, to assert themselves. Uh, this is what Abraham realized. He was given the choice by his servant, find a proper shiduch for uh, Yitzchak or let him leave the land of Israel, the land of Canaan at the time. And uh, his servant actually asked him a good question. He says, you don't want Isaac to marry even a good girl, perhaps with one of your followers. Uh, for, she's local. You want me to go back to your father's family all the way up in Haran and find a proper match for him there. But let's say she doesn't want to go. So should I take him there? Or should I, should I take uh, a wife for Isaac from among the locals? And Abraham actually thought, it's like, well, it comes to uh, one or the other. I guess the worst the worst thing would be Isaac leaving the land of Israel because God promised this land to me. And if I send my son away, that'll just leave me here. I'm basically, I don't know when I'm going to die. And he could be stay there and I'm gone. And that's it. There's only two of us. 
I've chased away my other son. He's not the chosen one. The land is not to be given to him. That's Ishmael. And I've been told that it's not you to be my, my heir. And even though I have many followers, this has to be stay in the family type of thing. So Isaac cannot leave. So he said, if it comes to this, they have to choose between Isaac marrying, let's say, a proper convert to the Abrahamic religion as it existed then, and Isaac leaving the country, I'd rather he marry and stay here. So we'll take whatever shidduch. Like I said, when Nikita Mishvot his uh, I, I release you from this vow. What was the vow? Not to take a, uh, a, a match for Isaac from the daughters of Canaan. And he's the local, the local people. That was that shows what Abraham. Uh, Abraham also had the same challenge holding on to the land. It was a test. Remember, they say one of his first major tests was there's a famine. Will he leave the land of Israel? And Isaac was also bidden, do not leave even after Abraham died. It seems shot, not like a, we, we, before we said, Rashi brings a Midrash. Uh, without resorting to the Midrash, God was telling him, don't leave the land because it's just you and your uh, son who's not come of, become majority yet. We don't know how old that Jacob was. Maybe he was 20, but he had not certainly become an assertive adult and come into his own at the time. So Isaac could not take him and his son out of the land of Israel, even though they were uh, faced with a plague. So we are going to discuss next time this idea, the, the, the difference between, let's say, the nation state, uh, the government, why this matters. Uh, what, who does God love? God loves the people of Israel. Does God love the land of Israel? Does God love the government? I would say no. Uh, and we're going to discuss that next time. So uh, let's just leave it that for now, this idea. And uh, hopefully in the coming days, we'll have some insight into this. What does it mean? Why is it that such a central facet of our religious practice and our identification relies on something that is so tenuous, uh, a connection to land that uh, not only is, is tenuous from a historical perspective, but is also a, a threat. If we do not do what we are supposed to do, we will lose our hold on the land. And then the whole challenge will be just coming back, just being able to immigrate, immigrate here. Jews have an easy time. It, it's technically easy to move anywhere else in the world, but moving to the land of Israel is so hard. Uh, any questions? No, I didn't see one in the chat. That was a technical thing. Now, unless there's any real questions, we'll uh, say shalom. And uh, um, Rabbi Avi, I have a question for you. Yeah, please. Just... Regarding, regarding to the halachi for Shemitah, that, uh, that Ashkelon and Akko is, is it considered uh, part of Israel or is in the is in, uh, border of Egypt? So Ashkelon and other places are quite clearly Eretz Israel. There was this idea that certain areas that the Philistines had were not included in the, in the conquest. It says that the, these areas over here, you see Ashton's over here, Ashton's over here, Gaza's over here, and there was Gat somewhere else in there, and there's Ekron also around this area. These areas are clearly included in the areas promised to Abraham. The areas described in the in the the, the parsha of Noah. And by the way, do you see them on the screen? Am I showing it right now? Can you see it? Oh, I didn't share it. Hold on. I, I've been I've been highlighting it on my screen, but I realized I didn't share it. These areas over here, the the major Philistine areas, Ashdod, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, uh, Gat, and Ekron, which you don't see on the map over here. Those are the five Sarnei Flishtim. Those are certainly included in the Promised Land and certainly including the land that Moses commanded the people to conquer. However, in the meantime, Moses says this in, in, in Devarim, there was a wave of, of Philistine settlement here. The Philistines were not Canaanites. They're not descended from Canaan. And the Jewish people did not go in, in Joshua's time and the, the later times, and conquer these areas. Only in King David's time that he finally conquered these areas. But he didn't even settle Jews there so much. Uh, they did control uh Jaffa, that became their, their port. That was the port that Solomon used. It was under Jewish control. But these areas, classically, they had a problem with it because the Philistines were quite powerful. And even when they did conquer them at various times, uh, they didn't drive them out. And that was a problem. So uh, it, they should be part of the land of Israel. And the last time the Jews also conquered it and started selling these areas, eventually, uh, Quite crazy. I don't know why I did that. Hope that I didn't hear your question so clearly. Was that the answer? Well, no, was you there? Can you hear me? It's your time. No, All right. So my question is: 
that is, it's my question is it's like it's considered that on Yontov, do they solve it one day or two days? Like a lot. A lot is a, like okay. there's a machlok, they, they say the yeah, that's that's that a, well, my question. What is this? So the, the question of two days of what? Yom, the question of two day Yom Tov, Yom Tov Sheni, is according to Rambam independent of what is Eretz Yisrael. The Rambam, uh, this is just a side point because it's I find this not not that interesting, but it will we'll just say what the Rambam says and then we'll say what the, the Ridva says. Uh, the Rambam says whether or not a place keeps two days of Yom Tov does not depend on proximity to Jerusalem or being in the land of Israel or not. What depends is uh, basically did did places uh, did those places receive the message uh, that the the Beit Din had decided what day is Yom Tov or what day is Rosh Chodesh, and they used to send out messengers basically on horseback to go to all the various population centers. So the Rambam says you could have a place, for example, like Kuchav Yaakov, just to the southeast of Ramallah here, because Jews had not settled there back in the day. So they never had a custom here to just keep one day of Yom Tov. He says a new, new settlements in what used to be wilderness within the land of Israel are supposed to keep two days of Yom Tov even today. And that's not the, the common practice, by the way. The Rambam basically says there are many places in the land of Israel and beyond the land of Israel that should keep two days of Yom Tov. And he also says anywhere that's beyond 10 days from Jerusalem, 10 days journey back, you know, based on, you know, the old technologies, those are where they keep one day Yom Tov. And the places where they would never used to get the message, those places keep two days. And that, of course, would exclude places like Eilat, but places like Gaza and Ashkelon, they would still keep one day of Yom Tov. The Ritva basically says, no, whatever is generally speaking uh, is Eretz Yisrael keeps one day. And what's not Eretz Yisrael keeps two days. And then we have to know what was Eretz Yisrael in Second Temple times, as uh, those defined borders, and what was not. And that would be the line. But nowadays, the general practice based on 20th century post kim is whatever is part of the modern day Israeli community keeps one day of Yom Tov, and whatever is not keeps two days. So when Jews lived in the Gaza Strip and just beyond it, uh, they keep one day of Yom Tov. And so too in Eilat, even though Eilat is technically not halakhically land of Israel, it's part of the greater modern day Israeli settlement within the land of Israel. So they would keep one day of Yom Tov. If the border, if Israel's border was more to the north and encompassed the areas it's supposed to encompass, uh, for example, more along the Lebanese coast and more of what's today called Syria and these areas over here in the Transjordan, which were owned by the tribes back in the day, then they should also be keeping one day Yom Tov. And uh, I don't know, what do people do when they cross over to Taba, which is basically the, is the Egyptian part of a lot? Remember, it's a one big uh, city. Uh, every there's three countries over here own parts of it so in Taba I think they keep one day Yom Tov like when Israelis cross the border to go to those Israeli resorts just south they keep one day Yom Tov there because just an extension of the Israeli settlement nowadays but there there is a lot to discuss like I said we don't follow Maimonides in this regard and uh but that's that I think it's an even a dependent question right now we're talking about what is Eretz Israel strictly according to Allah and why does that matter for us I have, can I ask you one last question? According no. to Torah, yeah. according to Torah, you have a there's a, a there's an option. You're allowed to leave uh, uh, to leave everything as well. One for shiduch, life in danger, Palnasa, and Tamu Torah. Yeah. So uh, Yaakov, Yaakov left everything as well because of Sakana, because Esau was uh, was crying, uh, was running up. He was trying to. Uh, gun, he wants to, to kill uh, um, Yaakov, but he also was and, going to get a shidduch. What he also was going to get a shidduch, his mother commanded it's, him to go get a shidduch in Chutzlaret. So that's that, that that's also included. I have a question for you, and uh, uh, like a vice. What say if it's some uh, someone left left other Israel to find the shidduch and the girl? Uh, what's more important, a girl? That you find the girl, she doesn't want to li- live in Eretz Israel, and then the, and this guy, he wants to live in Eretz Israel. What's more important, living in Eretz Israel or ma- get married or live in the Chutzaret? That's my question. Well, that, that's a very personal question. I think it would depend on the couple. 
uh, of course, he has the halachic right, so to speak, to compel his wife to move or say, I'm moving or that's it. But then again, she could just say, so I, I want out of this marriage. So he has to really know his wife, and perhaps he should even have discussed that with her before getting married. But he has no obligation specifically. He could be like Moses said, uh, yes, the people are supposed to live here, but if one individual has to be stuck at Chutzlar, it's so be it. Uh, like I said, it's quite a, it's a it's a, a personal question. I hope you're not in that situation, by the way. So that's why they say discuss this with the the with your dates beforehand. You know, don't get stuck in chutzlar, or you're, you know you're going to regret it. You know. Anyone else with a question? No. Okay. I didn't. Oh, I just got something. No, but it's not it's not related to this year. So I guess we'll see you next week. We'll continue with this. Uh, the idea of uh, like I said, uh, the state as opposed to the government and the people, the land. Uh, what do we learn from the prophets regarding this? And uh, God willing, then we'll go into something even more mundane, uh, Talitot and Sitzit. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, nice to see you all again. And uh, Shalom, Shalom. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Haim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one, if you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org. If you are inspired by Rabbi Bar Haim's message and would like to get involved in Torah Eretz Yisrael activities in your local area, Please fill out the relevant form by going to the link which appears on the screen.